Amen. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. It's great to be here again. It's been about a year. 11 months goes so fast. Um, but I'm, I've learned a lot whilst preparing for this session. I've gotten disturbed, and I hope to pass on the same disturbance to you. I don't want to leave you comfortable. Now, about, I would say, three months ago, I came across this quotation whilst reading a book. And it said, what have you bought with your life? That's not a good question when you're in the 60s. What have you bought with your life? Because we're counting 20, 25 years. And it got me to really think. And for you, we rephrase the question. For you that are younger, what will you buy with your life? Yes? Um, and I asked myself, what is it that I have done with my life? Now, what currency do I have? What currency do you have? The first currency we have is time, because time is life. How have I spent my life over the last five, six decades, Lord? How have I spent it? You gave me gifts. You gave me abilities. You gave me talents. Did I use them for myself, or did I use them for your kingdom and for other people? What did I do with the talents that you gave me over the last 60 plus years? Those are the questions that I was going through, yeah? And then, you've given me resources. You gave me opportunities. Call those treasures. How did I deploy them? Were they for just our personal fulfillment, enjoyment as family, or did we channel our resources to the kingdom of God and have something to show God, we bought this with the resources that you've given us for your kingdom. Could we do that? Yeah? Now, even bigger than those three T's is the kind of heart we had brought into the last six decades. Did we have a heart for you? A heart like David's, where God said, I have found David, a man after my own heart who will do everything, and once he does everything in obedience, he will fulfill my purpose in his generation. The biggest asset we have as we go through these years is our heart. And if our heart is right, then everything is going to be right. And so, what at this point in your life, you're 20, you're 30, you're 40, you're 50, what do you have to show God in those areas of time Talent and treasure and heart. What do you have to show God? What have you bought, you know, with your life? Now, you've got years ahead of you. And for those that are younger, it's probably 60 years. We're going to be asking the question through the next four weeks. And if you do Zendua through the next 12 weeks plus, what will you buy with your life? And you have an opportunity to define what you will buy with your life that you can place before God. He can be satisfied and you can be satisfied. So today we're going to begin one of our topics, and it's called the default versus the designed life. You know what a default choice is? It's already made for you. Are we living lives that choices have already been made for us? We're living a version that somebody else has designed for us, or are we living a designed life? That's the question we're trying to answer today. And I'll go back to a story that Bida and I have, when we were in our mid-50s, we went through what you call a late-life crisis. You guys talk about mid-life crisis and so on. There's such a thing as a late-life crisis, and it's very real. And you will come to it, and some of you have experienced it. And ours was triggered by the children leaving home. So we asked ourselves, our children are leaving home. What did we do with the last 50 years of our lives? Yeah? Looking forward, there's 30 more years ahead of us, 40 years ahead of us. What will we do with our lives? Now, we didn't have a template on how to understand our past and then look into the future. So what we did is that we said, God must have a way of thinking about our past and our future that we can tap into. And so we read and read and read and we put together a manual called Tamati, which means finishing well. And God had a model for us with which we could reimagine our future. We didn't like the future of 
My dad worked for the government. At 55, they give you a Land Rover, you put your things in there, and you go back to Kakamega. To do what? Retire. You've got your cows, you've got your maize, and that's your life. But that didn't seem to be a template, you know, for us with our hearts for God and so on. And so Tamati helped us begin to process our late life crisis. We had 110 seniors, um, that was six years ago, do the study. And this is what they came up with. And I'll tell you some of them so that you, you know where you're going to. And if you're here, you're that age, you know it. There was this feeling coming into the study, it is all over. Life has peaked and the rest is downhill. And downhill for 30, 40 years can be a very long time. And the speed picks up as you go down, okay? There is a sense of irrelevance. I used to be the MD. I used to be on the elders' court. That's no longer a title that you use. So what am I, you know, right now? And you become invisible because there are other people who are taking this space. And so what is it that we can do in order to remain relevant? Then there was the expectations gap. We had a dream in our 30s. And now the reality on the ground is that it wasn't quite there in many things. Certain things had exceeded, and you know, thank God, and we didn't know how, but there was that expectations gap. And we want, during Zindua, to help us reduce that expectations gap by planning and praying properly about these things. And so dissatisfaction followed. With that dissatisfaction, we had regrets. If only I could go back to a 25, 30-year-old person, what different decisions would I make that would get me to my 40s, 50s, 60s, ready now to finish well? What decisions would I make differently? That was a big question that we are asking ourselves. And so you have this disappointment, you know, and you ask yourself, could we have lived a default life? Were we just following a pattern set for us? That's why we're having these regrets. And so we're asking ourselves, the assumptions that we had, were they the best assumptions? Were they the right assumptions that um, God wanted us to have? So we found a purpose for the future. And it was found in Psalms 92 verses 12 and, 13, and 14, fruit 14. The righteous will flourish. They will bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green. This was a way we could reimagine the future for ourselves. That we were going to have relevance, that we were going to have vitality, and that we were going to be of use to the kingdom. And we began to reimagine our future in that regard. But we also looked back, and instead of regret, 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 we reframed our past. And we said, there are lessons here that we have learned that can be of value to the people in their 20s and 30s and 40s. And so our past became relevant for people at that stage of life. And so that birthed the idea of Zindua. Where can we take our lessons to so that they can be helpful to the people who are in their 30s, 40s, and even early 20s? And so we feel like something good came out of that. We wanted you, people who are younger, to get into their 30s and 40s having lived a God-designed life, okay? and not a default life that had been imposed on us by the world. That was our desire as we got at the end of that process. Now, let us go through some of the assumptions of a default life, and you'll recognize them. One is that they are largely unconscious, and they are driven very naturally from our family of birth. And our families are complicit in this. Now, I know I hear our families have done a lot of good, but they also bring along with them certain expectations, certain values that we unconsciously take on. And they are some areas that we want to look at. First of all, we look at assumptions about life, assumptions about parenting, assumptions about money. 
Now, I know there'll be some discomfort, and it's meant to be there in order for us to begin to search. And there is some good in these things, but also the evil one can corrupt them and deceive us. He takes some truth and twists it a little bit. Let's go with this one, and every one of you likes it. Life is about self-actualization. That is the goal of my life, and I feel actualized in this area and in that area. Who said it was about self-actualization? Have you had this conversation with God about what your life is? Is it about you? No. Life is about God actualizing his purpose through my life and not about self. It is about God actualizing himself. And so now we need to look to God. How can you actualize your goals and purposes through me? This one is easy. We do it unconsciously and we will deny, but at the bottom of it, we know life is about getting and not giving. Anybody who gives is a fool and they're wasting their lives, yeah? Yet, life is actually about giving. And as we give, we are blessed, and as we serve, we are blessed in ways that we could never have imagined. Okay? But life is about giving. And as we go through this process, we need to embrace that. A big one on parenting, something that your parents taught you and you've grabbed it, I grabbed it and I ran with it, and with this family, the same thing. Um, an expensive education is good quality education. So as parents sold properties and they sold everything and they lived poor, they had tattered shirts and so on, just to take us to the very best schools and my wife went to the school alliance and those who are here can say, yay, you know, ask me just somehow. <laughs> So, um, a good quality education is expensive. Not true at all. A good quality education comes from the way you send that child to school and what you do with them before they get into the education system. But we've bought into this, and I bought into it, you know, as well. And you invest a lot of resources in that. Successful children is the goal of parenting. I remember once us being with our sons, with Mike, and we had gone out camping and so on. And we asked our children, what, what do you think we want for you? And they said, you want us to be successful. And then secondly, they tagged on, you want us to be godly. Do you see what the priorities were? Where did the priorities come from? Came from us, as parents. Our goal, unconsciously for them, was we want them to be successful. Okay? Yet the goal of parenting is godly children who find their purpose in this world. Okay? How do we do that? And that's something we'll be examining. But that's something we have bought into and communicate unconsciously to our children. And so we invest a lot of money in academic, and we invest in extracurricular, but we don't invest in making them spiritual. We don't invest in finding their sense of purpose. Okay? But now let's look at the big one, money and prosperity. The, assumption, the assumptions and the beliefs that we pass. Money is the source of security. We don't question that. Peace and happiness. You've heard that? No, but it's there. Internally, we communicate it, and there's enough advertising to go with it. But you get there, 81 years old, you make your money, you realize you don't have everything. Come and show me how to live a godly life. And so, it falls apart. When you get into your 50s, you realize, no, it's not about um, money doesn't buy me these things. I've got to do something else. Second one, a high standard of living gives you a good quality life. Just having money and a high standard of living will help me. But we know poor people who've got good relationships, who've got good character, who've got a sense of purpose without that money to buy that. Um, the third one, material success is an indication of God's blessing. We buy that. And there are churches that are built on that, you know, that God will bless you materially. There is truth in that. In the Old Testament, for the nation of Israel, that was what God put up. But going to the New Testament, the story is very different. In fact, there's warnings in the um, New Testament. Okay? So, how about all those poor people? Are you saying they don't have the blessings of God and they don't have a place and they don't have a presence? He doesn't have a presence in their lives? No, okay? 
Then the fourth one, which if you're in the 50s and 60s, you hear it a lot, passive income equals good retirement. And we are taught that. And we work on it because we believe that if I can only can have passive income, I've got a good retirement. By the way, money is good in retirement. And our passive incomes are very, very useful, okay? But there are other things, and we'll talk about them later. How about godliness? How about character? How about relationships? How about contribution? And those part of the package that are even perhaps bigger than the money and the passive incomes, okay? And you get into the 50s, you realize you may actually have bought into a lie. There was some truth in it. Satan took it, twisted it, and corrupted us, and we bought into it. Okay? Now, let us go on to a God-designed life. How do you live a God-designed life? The way you live a God-designed life is challenging those assumptions, and there are many more assumptions than those eight that we've had. And as we do Zintua, we'll go to the many, many assumptions we have made. You've got to know that those assumptions come out of the world. They come out of the world. And John, speaking to a third generation of Christians, because John is speaking at about the age of 90, so he's speaking to the generation of his grandchildren, and he's warning them, time has passed, but everything in the world, John's, 1 John 2.16, everything in the world the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life come not from the Father, but from the world. So take all those assumptions you have heard, eight of them, plus more. Begin to suspect them and tell yourself, I will assume they're from the world. And God, Satan has taken good things and twisted them. Then now we begin to be, get into a God-designed life. Paul, speaking to the Romans and more to our verse, this was about 50 AD talking to second generation Christians and first generation Christians in Rome. Rome was a city like ours. And the culture was exactly like ours. Just read Romans 1 and 2, you realize it is no different. It speaks to, to us. And now Paul is arguing salvation for them, and he tells them all the complex issues of salvation. He argues for 11 chapters. And what is he doing for 11 chapters? Paul is working on their belief system. Paul is working on their world vision, which will affect their behavior. He spent a lot of time on what they believed trying to get them to understand the culture and trying to get them to understand God and what he does. And some of those things that he tackles about what they needed to believe was the corrupt human nature, which we all have, and that God, we fell short of his requirements to, um, to, to make him because of the holy God. And then Christ took him upon himself all our sins and gave us his righteousness, trying to really develop in them what God has done on their behalf. Then he takes them through into chapter 8, and he says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And then nothing can separate us from the love of God. Then now he crowns it, and he says, before you were created at all, before the world was created, God chose you sovereignly and made you his child. And so after saying so much in those 11 chapters, he begins to challenge us. And he says, these are the mercies of God. And we go to um, Romans 12, uh, verses um, 1 to 4. He says, with, wide, with eyes wide open to the mercies of God, I beg you, brothers, as an act of intelligent worship, to give your bodies as a living sacrifice, consecrated to him and acceptable to him. That's the best you can do. Give yourself entirely to God. Now, this is the catch, and this is what we're going to be working on. Do not let the world around you squeeze you into its mold, but let God remold your minds from within so that you may prove in practice that the plan of God is good for you and meets all his demands and moves towards 
the goal of maturity. Okay? Paul is aware, and you guys are aware, that the world around us is so powerful, it squeezes us into its mold by good assumptions and good beliefs. And we buy into them. And when you look at us, there's no difference between us and the non-believers. And we're talking about the same things, and, and, and we all agree, and so on. But that's how powerful the world is. How do we fight those um, powerful assumptions and beliefs? He recognizes we need the help of God to do what? To remold our thinking from inside. And we've got to lie, rely on God to do that for us. And then we need to intentionally work on this and work hard on it. It won't just happen like that. If we let it just happen, the world will speak to us and we'll believe it. And Paul tells us that this is work. 2 Corinthians 10.5, it says, We destroy arguments and every proud obstacle to the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Begin to pay attention to your thinking. This thought that I'm thinking about, how does it align with the scriptures? If it doesn't align with the scriptures, I need to take it captive to obey the word of God. It must be really, really intentional. It must be intense if we're going to live God-designed lives. Okay? Now, how do we start to live God-designed lives? And we're coming to a close you know, with this. The first thing you must do, you must receive Jesus. You must be born again. And uh, Corinthians says, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Without that fresh beginnings, you don't have anything to buy with your life that you can take to God. You don't have anything to show him. In fact, you await an eternity without the presence of God at all. That's what awaits for us. So we need to come to the Lord Jesus in order to live the kind of life that he has designed. Okay? The second way to live a God-designed life is to live a godly life. And in Ephesians, it tells us, for we are God's masterpiece. Isn't that nice? Sometimes you don't think you're anything, but we are God's masterpiece. He created a new in Christ Jesus. We can do, so we can do the works, the things that God planned for us long ago. God planned for us to love, to be kind, and to just be transformed in our character. He planned that for us. That's the first thing that he wants, and that's what he receives in heaven, the kind of people who have those values, those qualities. And so we need to live a godly life if we're going to have anything to show God that we have bought with our lives. And then number three we need to find God's specific purpose for our lives. Each one of us are very specifically made. Of the eight billion people that exist, there's none like you who has got very specific purpose. That's how special we are, and we need to find it in order to, to work it and take it to God and say, this is what I have bought with my life, and I give it to you. Um, Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. You may not be a prophet to the nations. You may be a servant. Whatever your role is, that's your appointment. You need to find it and submit it to God and deploy those gifts so that you can take with you and show God something. What do you buy with your life? And we finish with this. What do you buy with your life? You buy the approval of God. For God to be able to say about your life, whether it's 30 years, whether it's 40, 50, 80, 100, that I found in you a heart for me. That's basically what your orientation, that was your posture. And you obeyed. I know you fell apart. I know you sinned and so on. You came back, but you obeyed. That was on your heart. And I have served the purpose I wanted for you in your generation. That's basically what I want you to bring to me. And so this month, we'll be looking at this, unpacking it, and um, discussing more about it. But I want to pray, you know, as we close um, about some of these things that we've talked about. Let's, let's pray.
Father, thank you so much that you have called us to yourself. And amazingly, before the world was created, we were with you. And you created this world with us in mind to put us here, to give us life, to give us talents, to give us resources, to give us opportunities, so that we can do something with our lives, with our time, for you. And at the end of the day, to be able to show you, this is what I've done with the life that you have given me. And how, God, I pray that we would be receptive to how you have created us and how you have called us. And Father, I pray for those who don't know you, that Father, they would first make the step of coming to know Jesus and that we would all commit to a godly life and we'd all commit to serving in the ways that you have called us to serve. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. So mm -hmm. Thank you for that introduction. And I hope you are staying for the month to figure some of these things out. There are so many lessons that are constantly being brought our way. Um, so... As the month unfolds and as we get it into God's word and into his truth, at the end of this month, we are going to invite you to consider unpacking or evaluating your life with others. And so what the Zindua session is, is beginning the first Sunday of April, we'll be inviting you to come and be in groups of people who are doing life with you or will commit to do that with you but lessons from others who have gone ahead of us, who will be our facilitators, that we are able to go back to God's truth and to his scripture to ask, what is your perfect, pleasing will for my life? I don't know how many of you read um, the manuals of our, if you buy a, a TV, for example, or a microwave, <laughs> how many people know where their manuals are? Or read those manuals, which is so interesting because our culture sort of figures its way out minus the manual. And then one day you realize the, manual, um, the microwave can also bake. But you find out that 10 years later because you never read how to do that when you got the manual. And that is the truth of scripture. Imagine all we need to live a successful life is in God's word. Every single bit of it. And the world spins it. It tells us, you do you. It tells us, you know, I don't know what other things that have been spun. You know, leave the, the law of attraction all those things that are God's truth that have been spun in a particular way to define us in a way that is secular and not godly. It's all in God's word. I love what the New Living Translation says in Romans 12, this particular verse that we are memorizing. It says, stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total transformation and perfection of how you think, then this will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in his eyes. Ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of our service. If I would invite you to stand up for a benediction and reflection and a commitment to do some thinking, okay? Two things I want us to think through this coming week. One, what was my lesson for 2023? My one lesson. Perhaps you see, don't see it as a lesson because it was such big failure or such huge success. But out of that, what is your lesson that you're bringing in into 2023, into 2024 from 2023? Second homework question is, how will my 2024 be different? Because of what I know. And so my brothers and sisters, as you learn from God's word and truth, I pray that you would know that you're children of light and that you do not belong to darkness or night. So be on guard. Do not sleep. Be alert. Be clear-headed. Nighttime is for people who are asleep and drinkers who get drunk. But we who live in the light are called to be clear-headed, protected by the armor of love and faith, and wearing our helmet, which is a confidence of our salvation. I pray that you would know that he has given you all you need for life and for godliness to the power and honor of your name and that you would know, truly know, his good, pleasing and perfect will for your life.
We come before you, just thanking you for the word we've heard today, Lord. We thank you for just leading us and helping us to begin to understand our purpose in life, Lord. It's amazing just to know that each one of us, before we were born, Lord, you had a plan for us. So we're just praying that through the coming month and through this coming week, Lord, that we'll begin to come back to you on our knees asking you, why did you create us? What is our purpose in life? And so we're praying for every person in this church today that, Lord, we would come before you and just ask that you lead us um, in showing us what our purpose is. And now, if we say the grace, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forever now. Amen. Amen and amen. Have a great week. Please stay on for tea. Don't run off. God bless you.